oh, wonderful. I, I, I have two audiences. The more audiences, the better. Um, I am, oh, I get to do this. Get my Albany Law mask off. I am really thrilled to welcome you to the seventh annual Catherine D. Katz 1970 Memorial Lecture Series and today's presentation, Race, Adolescence, and Trauma, the Criminalization of Black Youth in America, presented by Professor Christine Nicole Henning. She's the Bloom Professor of Law and Director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic and Initiative at Georgetown Law. So welcome to those of us here in the room and to our community members who are with us on Zoom. The magic of Zoom. On behalf of the CATS Committee, I want to formally welcome Professor Henning to our Albany Law School campus. She's been a professional friend of many in the Justice Clinic, a colleague for many years, um, but she's also been known to others at Albany Law School in a more personal way. And as all of you who've taken clinic or trials, you always know that props and exhibits are really fun things to get a jury or an audience entertained. So if you were to look at the Yale Law School directory of 1992 to 93, it looks like, you would see someone called Jack S. Clark, a professor who's now at Albany Law School sitting in the back. Hello, Professor Clark. <laughs> You would see this very sweet, very young looking Christian <laughs> and hunting with a short haircut. And so <laughs> Professor Clark dig, dug up his old law school. They were classmates together. If you were to wander into Professor Anthony Haynes' office, that's right across from mine, you would know that he has on his, you know, we have limited bookshelf space from all of our years. He has the Georgetown University Law Center Clinical Program Investigation Handbook from 2007 to 2008. And he describes her as one of the most influential professors he's ever had. So today, we get to have the rest of the Albany Law School community, those of you who don't know her, to get to also learn from her. To kick things off properly, I have two, things, two jobs right now. One is to thank, in a very personal way, and I know the Dean will do so more formally, Betsy Katz, who's with us today, the daughter of our beloved and late Kathy Katz. And as a token of our appreciation for you always coming live whenever we hold it live for our events, uh, the Katz Committee has a token of our appreciation that we want to present to you right now. So just some flowers. And then my second job, you're welcome. My second job is even easier because it's introducing a former student of Kathy Katz, our uh, Dean and President, Alicia Ouellet. Hi, everybody. It is great to see you all here in person and on Zoom. Hi, Zoom people. <laughs> uh, glad to have you. Uh, welcome, formally welcome to the Albany, to Albany Law School and our seventh annual Catherine D. Katz Memorial Lecture. So I'm so glad that you could be here to, with us today. Um, we are in for a treat. Uh, we are going to learn and we're going to be engaged and uh, it's going to be fun. We're also going to learn about some hard stuff and have conversations after. And that's, that's what this is all about. It's an important way to honor our late dear friend, Kathy Katz, um, who was my professor uh, and um, someone who was a, a, a wonderful colleague and friend to so many of us. Many of Professor Katz's former colleagues and mentees have helped to carry on her legacy by speaking at this event in the past, including professors Melissa Brieger, <laughs> Ellie Lynch, Steve Clark, and uh, former professor Donna Young. We also have been really lucky to bring in some distinguished keynote speakers from outside of the school, including Jessica Naus, class of uh, two, uh, 2004, and last year's speaker, Kimberly Mutcherson, the dean at Rutgers. Um, today, 
We are incredibly fortunate to welcome Professor Henning. Uh, she is the Bloom Professor of Law and Director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic and Initiative at Georgetown Law. I went to a CLE just last week um, on juvenile justice and guess who the speaker was? <laughs> it was <laughs> Professor Henning. And so here's a confession. I hate Zoom CLEs. I hate them. Sorry, Zoom people. Uh, it's, they're not for me normally. This was the best Zoom CLE I have ever been to. It was so interactive. I learned so much. I learned from fellow audience people. I learned from Professor Henning. It was energetic. It was, it was just great. And uh, so good for you for being here because um, you are all gonna, gonna uh, learn something. And I expect nothing less than what the <laughs> Albany County Bar Association got. This is it's gonna be great. Um, so the lecture would not be possible without this woman here, um, Betsy Katz and her family. Um, I wanna thank you, Betsy, for supporting this and for giving us a chance to remember your mom every year. It means so much to all of us. She taught so many of us and inspired so many of us and her work lives on um, and it's more than just these lectures, it's every day in the work that we do. And thank you for your support. And can we give Betsy a round of applause? Thank you. And with that, I welcome you all. And I guess I call uh, Professor Lynch back up to the podium. Enjoy. So Chris Henning, you, you've read it on uh, the interwebs, you maybe saw her on MSNBC last week, or there may be other ways in which you uh, know a little bit about her bio. So I just want to give you a little more background before you hear from her directly as I introduce her. She really does it all. She's a prolific scholar, a renowned teacher, a fierce advocate for children and youth, a trainer of state actors across the country on the impact of racial bias in the juvenile and criminal legal systems. Uh, she started off after receiving a BA from Duke, a JD from Yale, and an LLM from Georgetown Law as the Stuart Stiller Fellow in the Criminal Justice and Juvenile Justice Clinics at Georgetown. After a fellowship, Professor Henning joined the staff of the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, where she continued to represent clients, but she was always a trailblazer. She was always an innovator. She organized a juvenile unit you know, designed to meet the multidisciplinary needs of children in the juvenile legal system. She served as lead attorney for that juvenile unit from 1998 until she left the public defender service to return to the law center in 2001. Um, she and her law students, what is it that they do in this juvenile initiative? They represent youths accused of delinquency in Washington, DC. And she's currently the director of the Mid-Atlantic Juvenile Defender Center. She's been doing this work representing children accused of crime for more than 25 years. She is also an incredible community partnership person. She worked constantly in partnership with communities locally, statewide, and nationally. She worked closely with the MacArthur Foundation's Juvenile Indigent Defense Action Network to develop a 41-volume juvenile training immersion program, a national training curriculum for juvenile defenders. She now co-hosts with the National Juvenile Defender Center an annual week-long JTIP Summer Academy for Defenders. In 2019, she partnered with them to launch Racial Justice for Youth, a toolkit for defenders. And again, in 2020, to launch the Ambassadors for Racial Justice Program, a year-long program for defenders committed to challenging racial inequities in the juvenile legal system. She serves on the board of directors for the Center for Children's Law and Policy. She served as an expert consultant on juvenile justice to a number of state and federal agencies, including the US DOJ's Civil Rights Division. She was the reporter for the ABA Task Force on Dual Jurisdiction Youth. She's a lead contributor to the Juvenile Law and Practice Chapter of the District of Columbia Bar Practice Manual, and has served as an investigator in eight state assessments of the access to counsel and quality of representation for accused youth. And let's start talking about her writing. She has written extensively about race, adolescence, policing, her earlier work appears in journals and books such as Policing the Black Man, Arrest, Prosecution, and Imprisonment, which is edited by the brilliant and uh, you know, famous Angela J. Davis, Punishment in Popular Culture, 
edited by Charles Ogletree, who is just a leading funder in criminal defense, and Austin Surratt, another uh, professor in Bright Light. She, uh, in her article, race issues feature prominently, such as the reasonable black child, race, adolescence, and the Fourth Amendment, um, many others that I, I don't have time to go into all of them. Her new book, which we have here, and we can have book signings afterwards for those of you here, or if those of you online, if you want to purchase while I'm talking and prefer if she's talking, I will not be insulted, those of you on Zoom. Um, her book is The Rage of Innocence, How America Criminalizes Black Youth. Just out in September, it has been receiving critical acclaim as a brilliant analysis of the foundations of racist policing in America. Um, James Foreman, who famous Yale law professor and Pulitzer Prize winning author of Locking Up Our Own says, we've long needed a great book on race in the juvenile legal system. Thanks to Chris Henning, we have it. Um, a former director of the MacArthur Foundation said, Henning's vividly told stories, meticulous research and trenchant analysis teach us just how widespread the pernicious mistreatment of children in contemporary America is not just on the streets, but in our schools, courts, and social institutions. And Paul Butler, who many of us know um, as someone who has come out to, to talk about uh, many, many of these issues, particularly uh, in criminal justice, a vivid and engaging account of how Black children don't get to be children in the eyes of police, politicians, <laughs> and sometimes their own teachers. So we're not the first to honor Professor Henning, but as Chris has been learning, She's been selected for a very important honor, the Katz Lecture Keynoter, one of her most prestigious and distinguished honors. Others who have honored her include the Juvenile Law Center's Leadership Prize, the Robert E. Shepard Jr. Award for Excellence in Juvenile Defense from NJDC, the uh, very prestigious Shannara Gilbert Award from the American Association of Law Schools for her commitment to justice on behalf of children. She's been selected to the American Law Institute and appointment as an advisor to the ALI's Restatement on Children in the Law Project. I remember first meeting Chris almost 20 years ago and thinking what a bright star, but also how humble, how human, how empathetic, how fun. And I'm glad to report she still is. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, Professor Kristen Henning. To all of you. Thank you for that generous introduction, Mary. So wonderful to be here. Um, and while we're getting set up, let me just start by saying thank you so much. One, thank you to you, um, Betsy. I am just honored to be here and uh, to represent your mother's legacy. So thank you. Thank you for your own commitment to justice. So thank you. Thank you to this wonderful, wonderful community. I feel like I'm at home. <laughs> when uh, uh, Mary reached out, I started looking at the, the roster of who's on your faculty and realizing how many friends and uh, former students, now colleagues, <laughs> classmates, um, folks deeply entrenched in the clinical legal education. So you all have a wonderful, wonderful community here. And I just thank you so much and scholars that, whose work um, that I have admired um, in Professor uh, um, Farley. So thank you all so much. And thank you, Dean, it's so wonderful uh, to meet you and connect with you uh, around that CLE. So I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, my final set of thank yous are to really the this wonderful Cats um, committee. Um, thank you so much for selecting me. Uh, I want to say thank you to Professors Lynch, Chung, Breger, uh, Connors, uh, Moyer. Um, thank you so much to um, Persia Wilkins and to Jeff and to Howie, who's out there, <laughs> uh, for making this all work. But I want to jump right in because, as your dean said, this is such a hard conversation, but an incredibly important conversation. So really more than anything, I am so happy to see so many students in the room, to know that there are students listening. Um, some students stopped by before uh, to say that they were gonna be listening in, and that means the world to me um, because you all are gonna carry this work forward. So thank you so much for being here. All right, let's jump right in. So, Let's see what's going. 
One second. Now the uh, he's not here. Uh -oh. You're gonna be my Vanna White. Yeah. Let's do it. No. Jeff, <laughs> we were good. I promise y'all. Yeah, we had this all done. All right, like, we had it all done. It, it shouldn't either. Okay, none of the, the advancing isn't is working. The advancing isn't working. Okay, I'm just going to do it this way then. Okay. All right. So you all, as as Professor Lynch said in as Professor Lynch said in her introduction, I am currently the director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic and Initiative at Georgetown Law. And with my law students, we represent children who have been accused of crimes, like uh, your Professor Haynes here did, representing children who have been accused of crimes in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Before that, I was the lead attorney for the juvenile unit at the D.C. Public Defender Service. So in total, I have been representing children for almost 26 years. So here's what's important. In that entire time, 26 years, I have only represented four white children. That's it. Four white children in the nation's capital. That 99% to one you know, ratio would lead you to believe either that there are, no black, there are no white children in the District of Columbia or that white children don't commit crime. I stand here to tell you that neither of those are true, <laughs> all right? And so it is really hard to do this work for a long time without beginning to ask the hard questions, right? So the questions are, is this happening all over the country? Why do these extreme disparities exist in the first place? How are these disparities affecting Black youth mentally, physically, psychologically, developmentally? Is the disparate policing and criminalization of Black youth making America any safer? Okay, and then if it's not, and if there's no justification whatsoever for these disparities, then what can we do about it as a community? That's where this book comes from, this set of questions. And so as in response to that first question, the answer is yes, of course. Disparities are prominent in every state in our country. And New York is no different. And just to set the stage, I wanted to introduce some, some state-based data um, to really make you feel this issue right here where you are. So let me just share with you that in New York, although Black youth make up only 16% of the state's youth population, they account for 49.4% of all young people who are referred to family court for a delinquency proceeding. Black youth are also all over the country significantly more likely to be held in secure detention once they are referred to court. And again, New York is no different. They account for 59% of all young people held in juvenile detention in, in 2020, right? So just last year. And just because, uh, and I should note for you though, that it is significant that even though the raw numbers, right, the rate of detention itself has been going down significantly across the state, racial disparities still persist, all right? And so compare this. So in 1997, black youth were detained at a rate 10 times higher than white youth in the state of New York. In 2017, Black youth were held in detention at a rate 12 times higher than white youth. And then just since we're in Albany, I really wanted to bring in at least one piece of local data, a couple of pieces of local data. And in Albany, although Black youth make up 19.6% of the city's population, youth population, they account for, get this, 80%. It's extreme disparities. 80% 
of all youth held in detention last year. Huge and significant numbers. Black youth are also significantly more likely to be held or to be incarcerated after they are found guilty at a trial or a plea. And in 2019, Black youth in New York were 5.6 times more likely to be held in or to be incarcerated in a youth facility um, than their peers, 5.6 times more likely. And then the final data that I wanna share with you here is that although racial disparities have begun to fall across the United States, they haven't fallen as fast in the, New in the state of New York. So there's so much more work to do. Um, so while black white disparities specifically, right? Black white disparities among youth incarcerated fell across the country, by 13%, they've only fallen by 2% in the state of New York, okay? So I just wanted to set the stage that this is real for you, this is real for where you are. But let's get back to the national narrative, the national story, and that is this. Whenever I talk about incarcerating young people, deep end incarceration, People invariably assume that I am talking about the incarceration of young people for serious violent felonies. How many of you know that's just not true? So the data shows that very few youth, very few youth commit the types of crimes that we're most afraid of, rape, murder, violent person assaults. Um, and instead, and, and that's true for any race, very few young people of any race. And it's equally true for black youth. The latest national data we have shows that only 9% of black youth were arrested for those serious violent felonies that we think about. Instead, the vast majority of young people are arrested for misdemeanors, low level property, um, just absolutely nonviolent threat uh, or <clears throat> theft, uh, they, uh, arrested for things like theft, um, property offenses, property damage, okay? Adolescent aggressive speech, I like to call it, talking back to an adult, okay? In ways that might sound like technically a threat, but far from it. What is really important for us to remember when we talk about this important topic is that there is a body of brain science and uh, developmental science that teaches us that young people of all races develop along the same fundamental trajectory, all right? So black kids don't have a brain or a developmental trajectory that makes them more violent than any other kid. So what do we know about adolescence, right? So if I asked you right now, what do you remember from your teen years? <laughs> who, who were you and what did you do, right? We know that young people are impulsive, reactive, sensation seekers, risk takers. Um, and guess what? The peer influence is not a myth, right? Teenagers do what their friends do or what they think their friends are doing, right? So they're following a crowd that's not even doing what they think they're doing, right? Um, they're often uh, really uh, bad decision makers. They're not great strategic thinkers and they don't think ahead to the long-term consequences. Well, guess what? That's true for all children of all races, and there's been international research showing that is true among children all over the world. Just not a, a domestic United States phenomenon. So here's where we begin to talk about race. Even when we get annoyed, right, at the recklessness of adolescence, we still treat white teenagers with tolerance, grace, forgiveness, compassion, and downright humor, right? It makes the big screen. And so some of you, the older of us in the room, <laughs> may remember this film, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, all right? I've been told by my students that I need to replace this with maybe super bad or something like that. <laughs> Hollywood glorifies, right? The humor of adolescence. Um, and so in this movie, Ferris classic joyride all over the city is a source of entertainment 
and humor. Although he stole a very expensive car from his friend's father, all right? But yet in The Wire, how many folks are familiar with this? If you're not, please watch, right? So The Wire, I call a docu-series, right? Um, based in Baltimore, Maryland with black children and the, ch the child here, Donut, who steals a car, right? It, 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 is, it is problematized as something you would never call that a joy ride, right? It would never be the source of humor and entertainment. That's the distinction that we're talking about here. So just for a little bit of fun, I really wanna drive home the, the point that black children are criminalized for every aspect of their adolescence, from the clothes they wear, from the music they listen to, to the way they style their hair, right? To going to a party, playing with a cell phone in class, um, playing with toy guns in a park. So just for a little bit of fun here for a moment, these children, right, are criminalized for wearing sagging pants, right? There are ordinances on the books in some cities that literally lead to the arrest and sometimes violent confrontation between police and youth off and police officers. Who's this, right? <laughs> the most famous sagger we know, right? As late as last year, Justin Bieber says, my pants will stay sagging and he's a fashion icon. These children are playing on their phones when they should be on their way to class. And this young lady on the phone, allegedly on the phone in class and gets you violently yanked out of her seat in South Carolina. We've got um, white youth who, are, who listen to heavy metal rock and country with violence and misogynistic lyrics with no consequence whatsoever. And black youth listen to rap and you would think they were the most violent criminals on the planet. We've got white kids who play with toy guns and it's cute, it's adorable. And we've got black kids who are at risk of getting shot for playing with the gun. And so the bottom line or the essence of this conversation is that while white youth are allowed to enjoy the privileges of adolescence, and this is really important. Adolescence is a social construct, right? that is available to the middle class and to white Americans. But the privileges of adolescence um, include physical safety, public affirmation, adventure, experimentation, social and academic freedom. But for young black children, same behaviors, they are suspended, expelled, stopped, frisked, arrested, prosecuted and transferred to adult court at extraordinarily high rates. And we cannot talk about the criminalization of black youth without talking about police encounters with youth, right? So focusing for a minute on that very specific police youth encounter. And I wanna be clear in the book, when I talk about the criminalization, I'm talking about all the ways in which we criminalize black children, even civilians, right? So it doesn't have to be a police officer, but that requires special attention. And I think so few of us really understand just how pervasive um, the presence of police are in, or the, the, uh, the pervasiveness of, of police are in the lives of black children. And so I think the best way for me to help folks understand that is to tell you a story and to give you an opportunity to hear from the young people who have encounters with the police. So let me just tell you about a client that we represented named Andre. Andre um, was a 15 year old black boy we represented in my clinic with my law students um, who was walking down the street in Washington DC. A police car drove up next to him. Now, it's really important. The boys weren't doing anything at all other than walking down the street. They weren't talking loud. They weren't roughhousing. They weren't uh, smoking weed, <laughs> using drugs, um, drinking alcohol, nothing at all. These officers drove up next to them, rolled down their window and said, did you hear any gunshots? I'm gonna tell you now, the officers later admitted that there was a ruse. They never had heard gunshots. The boys say no and kept walking. 
the officers continued to follow them and said, hey, can you lift your waist? Can you lift your shirt so I can see your waistband? So the officers wanted to see if they had any weapons. Both boys lifted their shirt. Officers you know, uh, still weren't satisfied and asked the boys, well, can I search you? At which point the boys say yes. Four uniformed officers jumped out of the car, pushed the boys up against the, uh, the wall and frisked them. All right. As a defense attorney, we're representing children for all these years. And I'm still baffled at the number of children who say yes. My clients, black and brown children who say yes when police officers ask them for a search. And so I asked my clients, what in the world? Why would you, quote unquote, agree to this? And he said to me, wouldn't you? Because if I didn't say yes, they were going to frisk me anyway, or they were going to shoot me in the back if I ran away. That says it all, right? That's the classic police youth encounter in so many communities, urban, um, uh, uh, impoverished communities that are heavily surveilled. And I have to say to you that even in New York City, where the number of stops and frisks plummeted after national publicity and civil rights litigation, that was back in 2011, racial disparities still persist. Between uh, 2014 and 2017, talking six years after that massive uh, litigation in New York City, Black and Latino males between the ages of 14 and 24 accounted for only 5% of New York City's population, yet made up 30% of, 38% uh, percent of the reported stops and frisks. This is true all over the world, um, all over the country, I should say. Um, I also should say 2018, 50%, 57% of all people stopped in New York City were African-American, 31% were Latinx. 2019, that number continues to climb to 59% um, of the people stopped by the police were African American. So there is now a generation of black youth who have grown up under the constant surveillance of the police. My clients tell us all the time, they live in neighborhoods where police officers are present, parked on the street corner, parked in front of the convenience store at all hours of the day and night, stopping them when they come out of the convenience store. Where are you going? Where are you coming from? Well, so many people in our country, right? The vast majority of people in our country enjoy the freedom to walk down the street in their neighborhood without undue intrusion. Since we're in a law school, without reasonable, articulable suspicion, <laughs> y'all know that term, right? without reasonable articulable suspicion to believe they've committed a crime, right? We take that for granted, but so many black and brown youth do not have that basic and fundamental liberty in our country. And here's what's really important is that the impacts on young people are so traumatic. There is a growing body of research documenting the extraordinary psychological trauma that policing imposes upon black youth at one of the most important parts, stages in their development, their adolescent years. Research, empirical research has demonstrated that black children and Latinx children who have had frequent uh, contacts or who even just live in neighborhoods with heavy police presence experience high rates of fear, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, they become hypervigilant, meaning they're always on guard, not trusting others, and they don't trust police officers, and that distrust of police officers transfers to other authority figures, like teachers, people that we need them to be in relationship. Really, really important. <clears throat> what is so powerful about this research is that it shows that even that, that trauma occurs not only from being the direct target of these police encounters, but also from hearing about them from friends, family members, or someone who's close to them. So just having to worry about, I get up in the morning and I worry about having to, to, to face or encounter the police is enough, is traumatic 
for young people and produces the same kinds of symptoms that I talked about in that last slide. Even watching police brutality on the television or internet involving people that they don't even know is equally traumatic. And I know many of us in this room can speak to that. Watching on television as George Floyd died, right? In front of our very eyes. Now imagine that, imagine that feeling if you're a young black child who believes you can be next, right? <clears throat> that takes on a whole new dimension, right? And so it's really um, important to remember that this sort of vicarious contact, <clears throat> excuse me, this vicarious contact is, is, is pervasive and leads to significant trauma like post-traumatic stress disorder. What I found really fascinating about this study was this study was a follow-up to some of the work <laughs> that had been done after the Twin Towers collapsed and after the Boston Marathon bombing and even after Katrina, when people watched on television as, as folks were stranded on bridges, what the research shows where people were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, right? <clears throat> and other types of depressive symptoms. On one end of the spectrum, people were, they're back to that hyper arousal, experiencing it or re-experiencing it as if they had been there. And then on the opposite end of the continuum, having this numbing or despondent sensation from watching, right? And so this empirical research takes that methodology and says, well, let's look at what happens to people and particularly black and brown adolescents specifically focus on the adolescent years, what is happening. So it's a really powerful um, <clears throat> evidence of the trauma. So <clears throat> research also shows, and I think this is really important, and this was so true with my clients, and you'll read about some of this in the book, but that my clients often talk about insomnia. So I, have, I would show up in court and I would see my young people sitting like in the hallway, sound asleep. I'm like, you're here for court, how can you be asleep? And then I would understand from my conversations that they were mentally and psychologically wiped out. And so the research, this was really powerful research, showed that young people, teenagers in particular, who live in heavily policed neighborhoods and have frequent stops with the police report, again, high rates of sleep deprivation or very poor sleep quality. And any of you who has kids, right, you know how children are when they didn't get sleep the night before, <laughs> right? So it means that they can't focus in school the next day, they are um, emotional, right, and impatient, and that they can't engage respectfully and calmly with teachers. So it's this spillover effect, right? So the kids go to school and they're not ready to engage. And so one of the most important ways that policing affects adolescence is in adolescent identity formation. It sounds like a fancy word, but it's actually one of the most important things that happens during our adolescent years. That's how we figure out who we are and who we can become, right? And so the research shows that young people who have these frequent contacts with the police um, are more likely to question, to question their self-worth, question their engagement and, their, and whether they belong in society. The same body of research also showed that negative experiences with the police also had a very harmful impact on their perceptions of law and law enforcement. And so uh, what we learn and our perceptions about law and law enforcement um, during our adolescent years really become fixed in our minds and they transfer, they carry us into our adult years. So early negative encounters, this is why adolescence is so important. Early negative encounters with the police has a real detrimental impact on how young people engage with the police, I'm sorry, engage with the police later in life. All right, so let me <clears throat> complicate matters, right? I gave you a very sort of one-sided story, didn't I? So let me um, complicate matters a little bit. And that is to say, some of you who are sharp out there are wondering, well, wait, so if Andre became my client, why did he become my client? So this is the kid I talked about earlier, he was stopped by the police, lifted his shirt. So he gets stopped by the police and Andre has a gun. Okay, so let's let that sit in. So Andre, has 
a gun. And so many of you might be thinking, our first reaction might be, well, it's a good thing. We wanna praise the officers for getting this gun off the street. So, but a much deeper analysis should really cause us to think twice about the consequences of this stop. It is far from clear to me that recovering Andre's gun improved public safety enough to outweigh the consequences. And the consequences include the harm done to racial equity, harm done to fundamental privacy, um, harm done to community respect for law enforcement and the psychological well being of Black youth, okay, which is what I have been talking about. The officer's decision to stop these, these children was clearly laden with racial bias, right? With racial perspective, right? Doesn't have to be animus, right? Doesn't have to be intentional discrimination, but their assumptions about these young black boys really um, had a significant impact on the decision to stop them. So let's think about though, these consequences. Here's what's really important. We have to understand that the vast majority, I've used this word a lot. <laughs> these aren't like, you know, small numbers. The vast majority of people who are stopped by the police do not have a weapon or any other contraband at all. Um, many of you being you know, close to New York City were aware of the data that was first released back in 2011, showing that out of 689,000 stops, police stops in New York City, contraband was only recovered in 2%, 2% of those stops. And we know those stops, the vast majority of those stops, 84% involve Black and Latinx people, right? And that's true all over the country. I keep saying that. Um, in, 19, in 2019, more recent, eight years later, 93% of the frisks resulted in no weapon being found. Let me draw that in back to Andre. That, yo, that very low yield rate was also evident in Washington, DC, where my client Andre was stopped. And in fact, data involving youth stops specifically found that 412 youth were stopped in a 30-day window between July and August of 2019. All right, here's a sticker. Of those encounters, a gun was found in only four of those stops. Not 4%, but four, the raw number four. Um, drugs were found in only one of those cases. That's it. Out of 412 stops and frisks of young people in the District of Columbia during that day. And so during that 30 day window. So that means we are willing to traumatize. Remember all the trauma research? We are willing to traumatize 407 youth to get four guns off the street. And it's that trauma that is so incredibly important. And the ripple effects of that trauma are so incredibly important. The research shows that young people who experience these high rates of stop and frisk actually increase crime after stops and frisk rather than decreasing crime. And that is true, that research shows that is true regardless of whether the child was innocent, never had any contraband in the first place or guilty, had something. That the, the, the stress associated with policing creates a level of anxiety um, uh, and, and hopelessness, all these things that we talked about that actually leads to an increase in crime. So at the end of the day, um, kids aren't any safer, police aren't any safer, and the public isn't any safer from this aggressive uh, strategies that we have for policing that continue today. And I think it's really important when I talk about this to remind folks that the stories that I collect in this book are really contemporary. They aren't relics of the stop and frisk era for 2011. And it was absolutely tra traumatic for many of us, but in Washington, DC, our police chief literally went on one of his last public <laughs> event, uh, uh, 
uh, speeches and said that we in the District of Columbia don't stop and frisk like New York City. And of course the whole city went crazy. <laughs> um, people just don't understand how pervasive, and I really just wanna underscore this, how pervasive that police contact is with young people in our cities across the country. And so police officers will often say to me, I do trainings for police officers. Well, I asked him to list, lift his shirt. That wasn't a stop or a frisk. Sorry. What young person thinks that's not a stop and a frisk? Maybe you didn't lay your hands on him, but the traumatic implications are there. And so I can't move on from this uh, conversation about policing without at least saying a word about policing in schools. Um, and so school resource officers, I think most of us know now appear in all 50 states. And for far too long, I accepted the often, the frequently repeated uh, justification was that we have school resource officers because parents and teachers are afraid to send their children to school after the mass shooting in Columbine in 1991. I mean, 1999, excuse me, in 1999. And so here's the deal. Although Columbine did indeed have a significant impact on the increase of school resource officers, the evolution of school resource officers started long before that, right? Um, many of you know it started, uh, that story started back in the mid 20th century. In as early as 1939, the first pol uh, police and schools appeared in Indianapolis after early concerns about integration of black children, potential integration of black children in schools. SRO school resource officers grew exponentially in the civil rights era, really as a, uh, as a facade, the idea that we're gonna help facilitate integration when we can see all the iconic pictures and we know that police were there impeding the integration effort. And then by 1958, community leaders, police officers and teachers formed the first school police uh, liaison programs. And by 1991, this is what's significant, by 1991, eight years before Columbine, um, which took place in 1999, we have the National Association of School Resource Officers has formed. And where are school resource officers after 1999? Remember the Columbine, uh, the massacre in Columbine took place in uh, a, a suburb, right? Wealthy suburban community with mostly white students. School resource officers are far, far, far more likely to be present in schools, urban schools with black and brown children. Um, and we know that more police in schools means more arrest in schools, more arrest in schools more, means more black children refer to the court system. And throughout the country, black children are more likely to attend school with police, more likely to face discipline, uh, by, by school resource officers and by teachers and more likely to get arrested at school. Black students, in fact, the latest data shows they are three times more likely to get arrested at school than a white student. And of course, New York is no different. Data shows that black students um, in New York schools are 2.6 times more likely to be suspended than white students. Um, and in Albany, to bring it home, Black youth are 3.7 times more likely to be suspended than white youth. Really significant. Okay. Um, and I think it's important to note that these disparities are even more disturbing when we consider the empirical research that shows that school resource officers actually don't make schools any safer. That is actually, there's no empirical grounding. Quite to the contrary, there has been empirical research showing that, um, that traditional law enforcement strategies are more harmful than helpful, in part because they contribute to the criminalization. I'm sorry about the, uh, I switched from a Mac to a, a, a uh, uh, PC here, um, the criminalization, they contribute to the criminalization of normal adolescent behaviors, they contribute to poor attendance and lost instruction time. They can contribute to poor academic achievement, increased criminal legal involvement, and what have we been talking about? Increased trauma for young people. So how do we use this information to drive change? That's what's important. That's what we want to know, right? So I don't just tell stories and research um, uh, just for the, the sake of knowledge. What do we do with it? So I argue that I, I, I present my uh, 
uh, remedies really in four broad themes. And one of them is, I say this all the time, we have to radically reduce, um, I hear a little something here, radically reduce. It's not you, it's the lights or the fans. Ah. We're making a note to ourselves, Professor. <laughs> it's all good, you can hear me, everybody can hear me? Yes. So our goal has to be to radically reduce the footprint of police in the lives of all children especially black and brown children. We have to invest in alternatives to public safety, sort of law, traditional law enforcement approaches. We have to ensure developmentally appropriate policing when policing is necessary. And we have to insist upon developmentally appropriate responses to adolescent offending. So recognizing that some children do commit crime, what do we do about it? And so when we talk about radically reducing the presence of police in the lives of young people, that starts at school, right? And so there's this national movement afoot, as many of you know, of called the police free schools movement. And it sounds so much more radical than people think it is. Defund the police sounds so much more radical than people think it is. Really, it's about identifying, zeroing in, being nuanced in our assessment of what it is that we need police officers to do and let them do that. And then figuring out what we have police officers doing that they're not equipped to do and reallocating resources more appropriately, right? And so in the school context, right, what is the best strategy to ensure public safety and to what let children learn? It's all about um, investing in a public health approach, right? So it means that we're gonna reduce some funding, yes, for police presence, for surveillance equipment, and then investing in the alternative. And again, the slide, I apologize, didn't translate well, um, but we're gonna adopt a holistic public health approach that focuses on relationships, relationships between the teachers and administrators and the students that is racially just, that is restorative and that is trauma informed. So what does that look like? That looks like having counselors and social workers and mental health providers. It means we have peer intervention specialists. It means we have positive youth intervention, social, emotional learning, all of which you can read about. Why? Because there's been empirical evidence demonstrating that they are more effective for school safety and for community safety writ large, right? Even in violent communities, violent in violence interrupters, credible messengers who have experienced trauma and challenges in their lives that go out into the community and help mediate. All of that is important. Um, I talked about when police are necessary, right? So in those occasions when police are necessary, we have to have developmentally appropriate policing. That means training in adolescent development. You'd be shocked at the number of police departments that do not have training in adolescent development or de-escalation strategies for what? That emotional and impulsive, impulsive child. <clears throat> so think about you who have teenagers and your teenager acts a fool, <laughs> for lack of a better word, right? <laughs> what do you do? You don't call the police, you don't put them in handcuffs, you don't body slam them, you don't tease them, you don't call a canine on them, you use parental tactics, <laughs> right? You engage them um, in de-escalation, allow them to calm down. That's what police officers have to learn. We have to have regulations around use of force, um, prohibit the handcuffing of small children, prohibiting interrogation without um, a lawyers present, prohibiting this practice of asking children to consent to a search all across the country. So there's been some legislative advocacy around that. The, the practice just needs to stop. What child, forget a forget child, the intersection of childhood and race. What child <laughs> thinks they can say no to a police officer who says, can I search you, okay? And then you add that race element, the fear and the trauma. There's no black child. I just, I say this, <laughs> there's no black child in America who thinks they can say no and walk away. So it, it's just a practice that has to stop. We have to learn to treat children like children by not transferring them to adult court. So that means those deep end kids, the kids who are engaged in violence, right? We have to use strategies, evidence-based strategies to, to address that. 
There are programs or frameworks, I won't call them programs. There are frameworks, blueprints for working with the most, um, uh, even the most violent child. And I'll, so I wanna end with the good news, which is that um, advocates in New York have um, achieved some great success in youth justice reform. As I imagine most of you or many of you uh, know that advocates in New York convinced lawmakers to raise the age um, uh, of juvenile court jurisdiction, which means that 16 and 17 year olds are no longer automatically referred up to adult court. Um, and this is really significant. Um, and that was that passed in, in October of 2019. What's really significant is that means over 28,000, 28,000 young people ages 16 and 17 are no longer um, uh, uh, potential candidates for adult court. Really, really important. Um, and 70%, again, you remember I told y'all earlier, vast majority of those kids who are being arrested at 16 and 17 and sent to adult court, misdemeanors. 70% were misdemeanors, and you know where I'm going next. 70% um, of them also, 16 and 17 year olds, were Black and Latina. So this was a really important um, move um, for, for youth justice. And advocates have also been working in New York to prevent the arrest of the youngest. So we've got to do work on the bottom end, right? So preventing arrest of the youngest children. In 2019, I was really blown away by this data. Um, 2019, 820 children, 12 years of age and younger were arrested in the state of New York. That's amazing to me. And 121 petitions, meaning prosecutors made the decision to move forward on 121 of those cases, 12 years old and younger. Why are we using the court system, the criminal legal system to address adolescent behaviors at 12? And I'm gonna say, I'm a, you know, I don't know what they did because we know they're not murders and rapes, okay? The, the data just doesn't bear that out. Why are we using the criminal legal system to address that kind of behavior? It's just appalling. And of course, as many as 90% of those children 12 and younger were black and Latina. I just really want that to sit with you. It's really, really important. And then the final piece of good news from New York, though, and this is one of my favorite pieces of legislation, um, which is, I just found this out, <laughs> um, that in, uh, were two pieces of my favorite legislation, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, this is the same one. This is the New York State Assembly passed a bill, sorry, um, that would raise that minimum age from seven to 12 years old. Okay, seven to 12 years old, that's huge. It's one of the um, front runners in terms of states across the country doing that, which is um, putting a cap on the bottom and then raising that from seven to 12. That's significant, so kudos. This was my favorite piece of legislation, I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. And that was one on prohibiting shackling. This just found, uh, just came out last week, just last week. Um, the governor signed into law, uh, a law prohibiting the use of shackling in family court. And that piece of legislation applies to all young people in family court, 21 years of age and younger. That's huge, okay? That is huge. Why are we shackling children, right? And when you read my book, you'll see, I tell a story. This is how I got into this work. I, I had an internship in Durham, North Carolina, and the internship was at the district attorney's office. I walk into the courthouse, scheduled to meet with the DA that I was gonna be working for, and I ran into a row of children chained together, chained together by their arms and feet. Contemporary American society. And of course, they were mostly black and brown children, right? That changed my whole career trajectory. That's what I wanna do. I have to be sitting with those young people. So this piece of legislation, where I just literally found out in preparation for this um, talk today is really significant, right? This is not how any other country treats their children. And why are we doing this? So bottom line, we have to treat all children like children. And that really means we have to treat black children like they are children. So I am open for questions. I don't know who's going to moderate that. You want to moderate? It? And let me say, I actually, I could probably do it myself. I'll take the questions. And Howie out there, where is he? Uh, I can see him on my, uh, is he going to come back on my screen? Oh.
It's kind of going yeah. 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 I can now see Howie. Um, so Howie's gonna also uh, feed me questions from the um, from folks who are virtual. So any of you out there, please just type in your questions. We will get those too. But let me start here. Yes, please. The press or Andre. Oh, so yeah, <laughs> this is. <laughs> I know I did leave you hanging. So I'm gonna tell you a story. This is a really painful story for me looking back. All right. So this story is about. Um, that's one of the older stories in the book. It's about four, it's about four years ago. We uh, told our client, this is very real for the practice that we do, explain to him what, the, what, we, what we would do. We would file a motion to suppress, drafted our motion to suppress the evidence, and my client, the, the government gave us a phenomenal plea offer. There's no phenomenal plea offer when he shouldn't have been stopped in the first place. Our client took the plea. And so I say it's a heartbreaking story for me and a really another sort of life changing moment is I wish I had done better counseling with him to fight that. Right. Um, I also think that as a lawyer, I am much more I'm being brutally honest, courageous about raising race explicitly and intentionally in my cases. And so I think if I had litigated this, probably actually that case is about six years old. I, I probably would have, not even probably, unequivocally litigated it differently. And in fact, for those of you who are thinking about, you know, going into public defense and criminal um, uh, defense, I would say over the last six years, we have seen a radical shift, one in our own practice, but in the reception of courts to these arguments. And so all we have to do is file the motion. I, we cite to the trauma, the racial trauma. We cite to these racial issues and prosecutors pull back and dismiss the case on their own. Um, plus we win them in court now, in, at least in the District of Columbia. It's not true all over the country, but we are seeing extraordinary headway. So this is, this is one of those sea change moments. I use this as a training point where I just confess to folks. Like it takes time to really understand how to litigate race explicitly because they were adamant in court. They testified in court. So we did a preliminary hearing and they testified um, under oath that they admitted there were no gunshots. They admitted that they had no reason to believe that he was engaged in criminal behavior and that the only reason that they searched him was because the kids consented. How heartbreaking is that? So. Other questions? Oh, yes. Professor Henning, this is Howie. Hi, Howie. That's a, that's a great follow-up. Hello, DMC and Zoom attendees. Um, mm -hmm. There's a question from Melissa Brieger here. Professor Henning, my students often ask me this as well, but I would love to hear a response to Andre's concerns. If Andre and his friends had said no to a frisk, then law enforcement would likely be able to say they had to stop the kids. They had cause to stop the kids. Oh, absolutely. Oh my God, so that's a whole nother. Talk about CLEs. <laughs> so I'm actually doing another New York CLE. In, um, in mid-November, and that's my, that's what I'm gonna talk about there, is so all this trauma research that I share, there's a whole nother piece to it, right? So there is, I don't know if anybody's ever heard the term stereotype threat, which is, right? So it is the black uh, folks, period. I mean, stereotype threat uh, uh, operates across gender, you know, race, uh, a number of, of ways. But for our purposes, for this conversation, stereotype threat is um, the idea that African-Americans live with the pervasive fear that they will always be stereotyped as criminal solely because of their race. The research shows that people who live with this fear actually do one of two things. They actively go out of their way to try not to look guilty. So whistling classical music, holding their hands in a certain way, keeping their eyes you know, you know, fixed. Um, well, unfortunately, behaving in those ways actually makes you look guilty. So the stereotype threat responses, the ways in which we respond to that fear of being stereotyped leads police officers to believe that we're guilty. Okay, this is also true, just the anxiety, all that trauma that I talked about. Well, if you're if you're anxious and you're afraid of getting hurt by the police, what are you doing? You're shaking uncontrollably. Right. You're very nervous. You're fidgeting around the police. Well, the research shows this goes to this question. The research shows that anything you do right walking away from the police 
flight from the police, running from the police because you're afraid. All of these nervous gestures become justification for the police to stop you. And so it's really fascinating. There's been some empirical research where they, where they gathered a collection of police training materials. And they, they um, found all the places where police officers were being trained to look for suspicious behavior, indicators of threat. And they listed them, fidgeting, um, uh, eye glaze, um, clenched fist, tight jaw, shaking things of that nature, and they paired that with stereotype threat responses and found pair after pair after pair after pair. But police officers are never trained on the stereotype threat phenomena. So they're not trained on the false positive. So he's absolutely right. I mean, it, it's, it's a Hobson's choice for a black child, right? Stay put <laughs> or run, either way, you know, there's, there's no freedom. You have no benefit of the Fourth Amendment, of the you know, your liberty to be free. Yes. Let's get to a point where we're uh, uh, really very explicitly. Wonderful question. Um, oh, yes. Very good. So he asked, when in my career did I get to a place where I felt like I could litigate race? So I honestly, I tell the story. I think it's Andre's story. It was, I could not sleep after he took that plea. And we did tell him that we would litigate it. We were ready, but he, he just, he didn't want to take a chance. So many of my clients, they want out. I want out as quickly as I can. I think it was after that, the fact that I could not sleep, the fact that that case bothered me so much, we became very, very intentional. So Professor Lynch talked about some of the initiatives that we started. So we started the racial justice toolkit, which was, it, which is um, a, uh, a resource where we collect pleadings from across the country um, where people are litigating race. That was one thing. We began to collect uh, court opinions across the country where folks raise race and whether they were successful or not, we wanted to show the world that I mean, we can do this. Um, we created the Ambassadors for Racial Justice Program where we have 10 ambassadors every year who are defense attorneys, juvenile defense attorneys from across the country. And they participate for a whole year in, in thinking about ways to intentionally raise race. And then in our clinic, to be just brutally honest with you, we just made a decision. We're just gonna do it. If we get yelled at, we get yelled at, we did. We got yelled at a few times at the beginning and then gradually we stopped getting yelled at. Um, and so my, uh, my colleague, one of my favorite colleagues likes to say, we went from crazy pants to precedent, right? So <laughs> you go from, this is a crazy, I can't believe you're about to raise this, you know, that's crazy idea to raise race. And then all of a sudden, hmm, this is sounding a little bit more possible. Next thing you know, it's probable that we're gonna get some positive rules. Next thing you know, we've got precedent you know, set in, 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 in many of the states where, for example, here's one, flight. Flight from the police in a couple of states is no longer considered consciousness of guilt. Massachusetts was the first state high court um, in a case called um, a, a Warren, uh, yeah, Commonwealth versus Warren, if you're any interested in that, was really the first state high court to do that. Um, and so we're slowly seeing creeps. And I gotta tell you on that flight thing, I just love these little nuances when we're in this law school environment. Um, if folks remember Illinois versus Wardlow, Supreme Court case that said that um, it was appropriate for officers to consider flight and nervousness as consciousness of guilt. Even then, that case came out in 2000. Even then, Justice Stevens in his concurrence said, uh, we're on a slippery slope because there are many reasons a person of color, he says that many reasons an innocent person would flee from the police, especially minorities. So we begin to cite that. You ask, how do we do it? We started off before Commonwealth versus Warren, we started off citing to the, to the concurrence in Illinois versus Wardlow, and we would attach newspaper articles of Eric Garner, Freddie Gray, which is close to us in Baltimore, all these young people killed by the police. And we would say, this is why our children are running, Your Honor. They're not running because they're guilty. They're running because they're afraid. And so we slowly started to win. Um, so it's a great question though. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, mean, I am calling the people. <laughs> Who's moderating? Yes, you are. Uh, what type of rehabilitative efforts have you done for these children that uh, have gotten arrested? Because in my mind, you know, um, hopefully they get you and represent them when they get off the case, but they still have to go back to those safe neighborhoods. 
direct with those same officers. So what you do with your client um, then? Yeah. I, also, I think that's a great question as well. So our clinic, I mean, we're known for our holistic advocacy. And I came out of the DC Public Defender Service, which is also known as a national representation for its holistic advocacy. So what does that mean? That means we have social workers that work with us. We have um, housing experts, public benefits experts. And so uh, we have, um, I think I already said, um, education, special education, uh, education advocates. So what we do is we, we do take a holistic approach. That means we are referring our young people to mental health services. We are um, going into the school, meeting with the teachers. We are um, ensuring that they have a better uh, uh, IEP, um, which I think is now called something else now. Um, but you, so we 100% believe in holistic uh, uh, approaches. Also means vocational services. Um, it means spending time with our young people in their own communities on their own, in their own homes, instead of just having young, meeting young people at our office or meeting young people at court, you really get to know young people in the community. We um, connect them with mentors. So in our clinic, we started this uh, a program called Youth in Proximity, um, where we connect young people with, uh, uh, with adults in the community who can help meet both the basic needs as well as the, 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 the more uh, global needs like mentoring um, and health services. So it's a great question. I think you have to do all, both and. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna say this to you. I, I say, um, oftentimes when I get asked questions about what do you do about crime, I say to people, every single child needs one irrationally caring adult. <laughs> and young people are 10 times better off if they have a team of irrationally caring adults. That means no matter whatever stupid thing you do, because we all have done something stupid or impulsive, a mistake that you made, and I'm gonna stick with you, right? And I'm gonna help you and support you and create, help you create opportunities, um, give you space at the table to speak and be heard. Next question. Okay. And I don't know if Howie has anyone. Oh, Howie, how you doing up there? Doing great. We have no questions from our virtual all audience. Right. All right. Oh, there, look, oh, there we go. Professor. <laughs> and she did it pretty vigorously. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's a very bleak picture to end on. Can we get yeah. a question after that? Right. <laughs> I mean, but I, I mean, you asked the you asked a, a, a powerful question, um, and, and, and in some ways a painful question. Um, 
And I'm going to add a more negative, even more negative and intentional spin on what I understand oh, you're saying. I got a gun score. Yes. <laughs> uh, for three years and two weeks, I was wasting my life at the U.S. Attorney's Office. <laughs> that office did that I could not stop them from doing in D.C. was releasing white people as a routine. Yeah. It caught them going into the Smithsonian with guns. Yep, yep. So we're not doing this for black people, we call it guns. And they said, yeah, that's right. We're not doing that. Yeah. So you do play, okay, another bleak outcome. <laughs> oh, I have to change the inside. Yeah. <laughs> so though, I mean, look, I mean, this, okay, so let me just say one more negative thing and then I'll just, you know, we, we have to own what we can do, right? Um, is that, I, I think it's twofold. It's utilitarian, right? So this notion that um, there are so many uh, white Americans who refuse to see and accept black children as human and as worthy and as competent and as capable and as successful is in part utilitarian, right? Because what it, it is no coincidence that Emmett Till was a teenager when he was lynched, right? Because that made the symbolic statement that we, one, won't tolerate integration, but it's also a clear statement of the limits of adolescents, of, of black adolescents. And so that's really the other piece of this book, right? Is the intentionality that what is the most perfect time to set limits on a young person's development in those adolescent years, teaching them that there are bounds and limits because why they become a threat to the resources, right? Threat to opportunity, um, uh, you know, economic prosperity. So I think there's some intentionality to it. I think also though, um, it then became so deeply embedded that, that the narrative that was used to justify, for example, the killing of Emmett Till, right? You then have to justify it by painting in broad and intentional strokes that black children are a threat to white America, right? Um, and so that was intentional in the civil rights era, then it was intentional again in the 80s and the 90s, right? With the super predator myth and the war you know, on drugs and you know, um, the attack um, uh, on, on poor people, all of that was intentional. But now, this is where I, I wonder, you know, Professor Farley, how we, how, how, we, how we approach this, is that so many of, of people, white Americans are afraid of black children because of the deeply embedded stereotypes and fears that were intentionally planted historically. Right, so that even some of the good folks, so this is my hope, I'm gonna be honest with you. With this book, I don't think I can win all people. I don't think I can win that class of people. I think my hope is that it's a little bit smaller than you think it is. And that, um, I could just be wrong about that, but that there are people who are afraid, even in the Trump crew, right, that are afraid of black children because they have been fed that narrative. And it's those people from that set that I hope to reach, okay? That we need a massive cultural shift. And one of the ways that we get that cultural shift is literally becoming uh, proximate to young people, getting to know young people, hearing the voices of young people, hearing them tell them stories about this trauma. So I think I can get some people. I'm not gonna win them all. Because as long as it's utilitarian, as long as it serves the people, to limit opportunities for Black youth, we're not going to see our way out of it. So that's a whole nother, I think, uh, set of problems that we have to deal with. But I hope this book is for, um, for folks who just don't know, right? And who would be changed, hearts and minds would be changed if they did know. I think it's for folks who are already allies in the work but don't know how to address the work. I think it's for Black parents. Um, and black children whose voices need to be heard in this um, so that they you know, recognize that they're not alone in this. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful question. Um, I don't know how to reach that, that, that number that I hope is smaller than you think you yeah. Thank you. We're not good COVID social protocols uh, spirits. Um, so 
we've talked tonight about some hard conversations. The good news, and I have to say goodbye to my Zoom friends, but the good news is those of you who are here are invited to join us in the tent to continue these provocative questions and answers. And Professor Henning is going to grace us with her presence a little longer. And so we invite you to join us uh, in the tent outside. And, and if you don't know where that is, we can all go together. And there's also some books here if you would like. So thank you everyone for attending and particularly Jesse Katz.